Company H by Sam R. Watkins, Part 1 out of 5. Chapter I. Retrospective. We are one and undivided. About twenty years ago, I think it was I want to be certain, though a man whose name, if I remember correctly, was W. M. L. Yancey, I write only from memory, and this was a long time ago, took a strange and peculiar notion, that the sun rose in the east and set in the west and that the compass pointed north and south, and that the United States of America had no north, no south, no east, no west. Well, he began to preach the strange doctrine of there being such a thing. He began to have followers. As you know, it matters not how absurd, ridiculous, and preposterous doctrines may be preached. There will be some followers. Well, one man by the name of I think it was Rhett said it out loud. He was told to S-H-E-E, -E, then another fellow by the name I remember this one, because it sounded like a graveyard tombs said so. And he was told to S-H-S-H-E-E, -E, then, after a while, whole heaps of people began to say that they thought that there was a north and a south. And after a while, hundreds and thousands and millions said that there was a south. But they were the persons who lived in the direction that the water courses run. Now, the people who lived where the water courses started from came down to see about it, and they said, Gents, you are very much mistaken. We came over in the Mayflower, and we used to burn witches for saying that the sun rose in the east and set in the west, because the sun neither rises nor sets. The earth simply turns on its axis, and we know, because we are Puritans. The spokesman of the party was named, I think I remember his name, because it always gave me the blues when I heard it horrors Greeley. And another person by the name of Charles Sumner said there ain't any north or south, east or west, and you shan't say so. Either, now, the other people who lived in the direction that the water courses run just raised their bristles and continued saying that there is a north and there is a south. When those at the head of the water courses come out furiously mad to course those in the direction that water courses run and to make them take it back, well, they went to gouging and biting, to pulling and scratching at a furious rate. One side elected a captain by the name of Jeff Davis and known as One Eyed Jeff, and a first lieutenant by the name of Alex Stevens commonly styled Smart Alec, the other side selected as captain a son of Nancy Hanks of Bowling Green, and a son of old Bob Lincoln, the rail splitter, and whose name was Abe. Well, after he was elected captain, they elected as first lieutenant an individual of doubtful blood by the name of Hannibal Hamlin. Being a descendant of the generation of Ham, the bad son of old Noah, who meant to curse him blue, but overdid the thing. And cursed him black, well, as I said before, they went to fighting, but old Abe's side got the best of the argument. But, in getting the best of the argument, they called in all the people and wise men of other nations of the earth. And they, too, said that America had no cardinal points, and that the sun did not rise in the east and set in the west. And that the compass did not point either north or south. Well, then, Captain Jeff Davis side gave it up and quit, and they, too, went to saying that there is no north. 
No south, no east, no west. Well, us boys all took a small part in the fracas and shep. The prophet remarked that the day would come when those who once believed that the American continent had cardinal points would be ashamed to own it. That day has arrived. The compass just points up and down, and we can laugh now at the absurd notion of there being a north and a south. Well, reader, let me whisper in your ear. I was in the row, and the following pages will tell what part I took in the little unpleasant misconception of there being such a thing as a north and south. The bloody chasm in these memoirs after the lapse of twenty years, we propose to fight our battles o'er again. To do this is but a pastime and pleasure, as there is nothing that so much delights the old soldier as to revisit the scenes and battlefields with which he was once so familiar, and to recall the incidents, though trifling they may have been at the time. The histories of the lost cause are all written out by big bugs, generals and renowned historians, and like the fellow who called a turtle a cooter. Being told that no such word as cooter was in Webster's dictionary, remarked that he had as much right to make a dictionary as Mr. Webster or any other man. So have I to write a history. But in these pages I do not pretend to write the history of the war. I only give a few sketches and incidents that came under the observation of a high private in the rear ranks of the rebel army. Of course, the histories are all correct. They tell of great achievements of great men, who wear the laurels of victory. Have grand presents given them, high positions in civil life, presidents of corporations, governors of states, official positions, etc., and when they die, long obituaries are published, telling their many virtues, their distinguished victories, etc., and when they are buried, the whole country goes in mourning and is called upon to buy an elegant monument to erect over the remains of so distinguished and brave a general, etc. But in the following pages, I propose to tell of the fellows who did the shooting and killing, the fortifying and ditching, the sweeping of the streets, the drilling, the standing guard, picket and vidit, and who drew or were to draw eleven dollars per month and rations and also drew the ramrod and tore the cartridge. Pardon me, should I use the personal pronoun I too frequently? As I do not wish to be called egotistical, for I only write of what I saw as an humble private in the rear rank in an infantry regiment, commonly called Webfoot, neither do I propose to make this a connected journal, for I write entirely from memory. And you must remember, kind reader, that these things happened twenty years ago, and twenty years is a long time in the life of any individual. I was twenty-one years old then, and at that time I was not married. Now I have a house full of young rebels, clustering around my knees and bumping against my elbow, while I write these reminiscences of the War of Secession. Rebellion, state rights, slavery, or our rights in the territories, or by whatever other name it may be called. These are all with the past now, and the North and South have long ago shaken hands across the bloody chasm. The flag of the Southern cause has been furled never to be again unfurled, and lives only in the memory of those who lived through those bloody days and times. 1861. Reader mine, did you live in that stormy period, in the year of our Lord 1861? 
Do you remember those stirring times? Do you recollect in that year, for the first time in your life, of hearing Dixie and the Bonnie Blue Flag, Fort Sumter was fired upon from Charleston by troops under General Beauregard? And Major Anderson of the Federal Army surrendered. The die was cast. War was declared. Lincoln called for troops from Tennessee and all the southern states. But Tennessee, loyal to her southern sister states, passed the Ordinance of Secession and enlisted under the Stars and Bars. From that day on, every person almost was eager for the war, and we were all afraid it would be over and we not be in the fight. Companies were made up, regiments organized, left, 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 was heard from morning till night. By the right flank, file left march were familiar sounds. Everywhere could be seen southern cockades made by the ladies and our sweethearts. And some who afterwards became Union men made the most fiery secession speeches. Flags made by the ladies were presented to companies, and to hear the young orators tell of how they would protect that flag, and that they would come back with the flag or come not at all, and if they fell they would fall with their backs to the field and their feet to the foe, would fairly make our hair stand on end with intense patriotism, and we wanted to march right off and whip twenty Yankees. But we soon found out that the glory of war was at home among the ladies and not upon the field of blood and carnage of death, where our comrades were mutilated and torn by shot and shell and to see the cheek blanch, and to hear the fervent prayer. I, I might say the agony of mind, were very different indeed from the patriotic times at home. Camp Cheatham After being drilled and disciplined at Camp Cheatham, under the administrative ability of General R. C. Foster, third, for two months, we, the first, 3rd and 11th Tennessee Regiments Maney, Brown and Rains learned of the advance of McClellan's army into Virginia toward Harper's Ferry and Bull Run. The Federal Army was advancing all along the line. They expected to march right into the heart of the South, set the Negroes free, take our property, and whip the rebels back into the Union. But they soon found that secession was a bigger mouthful than they could swallow at one gobble. They found the people of the South in earnest. Secession may have been wrong in the abstract, and has been tried, and settled by the arbitrament of the sword and bayonet. But I am as firm in my convictions today of the right of secession as I was in 1861. The South is our country. The North is the country of those who live there. We are an agricultural people. They are a manufacturing people. They are the descendants of the good old Puritan Plymouth Rock stock, and we of the South from the proud and aristocratic stock of Cavaliers. We believe in the doctrine of state rights, they in the doctrine of centralization. John C. Calhoun, Patrick Henry, and Randolph of Roanoke saw the venom under their wings and warned the North of the consequences. But they laughed at them. We only fought for our state rights. They for union and power. The South fell battling under the banner of state rights, but yet grand and glorious even in death. Now, reader, please pardon the digression. It is every word that we will say in behalf of the rights of secession in the following pages. 
The question has been long ago settled, and is buried forever, never in this age or generation to be resurrected. The vote of the regiment was taken, and we all voted to go to Virginia. The Southern Confederacy had established its capital at Richmond. A man by the name of Jackson, who kept a hotel in Maryland, had raised the stars and bars, and a federal officer by the name of Ellsworth tore it down. And Jackson had riddled his body with buckshot from a double-barreled shotgun. First Blood for the South But at this particular epoch, I refer you to the history of that period. A private soldier is but an automaton, a machine that works by the command of a good, bad, or indifferent engineer, and is presumed to know nothing of all these great events. His business is to load and shoot, stand, picket, vidit, etc., while the officers sleep, or perhaps die on the field of battle and glory and his obituary and epitaph, but one remembered among the slain. But to what company, regiment, brigade, or corps he belongs, there is no account, he is soon forgotten. A long line of boxcars was drawn up at Camp Chetham one morning in July. The bugle sounded to strike tents and to place everything on board the cars. We old comrades have gotten together and laughed a hundred times at the plunder and property that we had accumulated. Compared with our subsequent scanty wardrobe, every soldier had enough blankets, shirts, pants, and old boots to last a year. And the empty bottles and jugs would have set up a first-class drug store. In addition, Every one of us had his gun, cartridge box, knapsack and three days' rations, a pistol on each side and a long bowie knife that had been presented to us by William Wood of Columbia, 10. We got in and on top of the box cars, the whistle sounded, and amid the waving of hats, handkerchiefs and flags, we bid a long farewell and forever to old Camp Chetham. Arriving at Nashville, the citizens turned out en masse to receive us, and here again we were reminded of the good old times and the gal we left behind us. Ah, it is worth soldiering to receive such welcomes as this. The Reverend Mr. Elliot invited us to his college grove, where had been prepared enough of the good things of earth to gratify the tastes of the most fastidious epicure. And what was most novel, we were waited on by the most beautiful young lady's pupils of his school. It was charming, I tell you, Reverend C. D. Eliot was our brigade chaplain all through the war, and Dr. C. T. Quintard, the chaplain of the 1st Tennessee Regiment, two of the best men who ever lived. Quintard is the present Bishop of Tennessee on the road. Leaving Nashville, we went bowling along twenty or thirty miles an hour, as fast as steam could carry us. At every town and station citizens and ladies were waving their handkerchiefs, and hurrahing for Jeff Davis and the Southern Confederacy. Magnificent banquets were prepared for us all along the entire route. It was one magnificent festival from one end of the line to the other. At Chattanooga, Knoxville, Bristol, Farmville, Lynchburg, everywhere, the same demonstrations of joy and welcome greeted us. Ah, those were glorious times, and you, reader, see why the old soldier loves to live over again, that happy period. 
But the Yankees are advancing on Manassas. July 21st finds us a hundred miles from that fierce day's battle. That night after the battle is fought and won, our train draws up at Manassas Junction. Well, what news? Everyone was wild, nay, frenzied with the excitement of victory, and we felt very much like the boy the calf had run over. We felt that the war was over, and we would have to return home without even seeing a Yankee soldier. Ah, how we envied those that were wounded. We thought at that time that we would have given a thousand dollars to have been in the battle, and to have had our arm shot off, so we could have returned home with an empty sleeve. But the battle was over and we left out Staunton. From Manassas our train moved on to Staunton, Virginia. Here we again went into camp, overhauled kettles, pots, buckets, jugs and tents, and found everything so tangled up and mixed that we could not tell t'other from which. We stretched our tents, and the soldiers once again felt that restraint and discipline which we had almost forgotten en route to this place. But, as the war was over now, our captains, colonels, and generals were not hard on the boys. In fact, had begun to electioneer a little for the legislature and for Congress. In fact, some wanted and were looking forward to the time to run for governor of Tennessee. Staunton was a big place, whiskey was cheap, and good Virginia tobacco was plentiful, and the currency of the country was gold and silver. The state asylums for the blind and insane were here, and we visited all the places of interest. Here is where we first saw the game called Chuckle Luck, afterwards so popular in the army. But I always noticed that Chuck won, and Luck always lost. Pharaoh and Roulette were in full blast, in fact. The scum had begun to come to the surface, and Shoddy was the gentleman. By this, I mean that civil law had been suspended, the ermine of the judges had been overridden by the sword and bayonet. In other words, the military had absorbed the civil. Hence the gambler was in his glory, Warm Springs, Virginia. One day while we were idling around camp, June Tucker sounded the assembly and we were ordered aboard the cars. We pulled out for Milborough. From there we had to foot it to Bath Alum and Warm Springs. We went over the Allegheny Mountains. I was on every march that was ever made by the 1st Tennessee Regiment during the whole war. And at this time I cannot remember of ever experiencing a harder or more fatiguing march. It seemed that mountain was piled upon mountain. No sooner would we arrive at a place that seemed to be the top than another view of a higher. And yet higher mountain would rise before us. From the foot to the top of the mountain the soldiers lined the road broken down and exhausted. First one blanket was thrown away, and then another, now and then a good pair of pants. Old boots and shoes, Sunday hats, pistols and bowie knives strewed the road. Old bottles and jugs and various and sundry articles were lying pell-mell everywhere. Up and up, and onward and upward we pulled and toiled, until we reached the very top, when there burst upon our view one of the grandest and most beautiful landscapes we ever beheld. Nestled in the valley right before us is Bath Alum and Warm Springs. 
it seemed to me at that time, and since a glimpse of a better and brighter world beyond, to the weary Christian pilgrim, who may have been toiling on his journey for years. A glad shout arose from those who had gained the top, which cheered and encouraged the others to persevere. At last we got to Warm Springs. Here they had a nice warm dinner waiting for us. They had a large bathhouse at Warm Springs, a large pool of water arranged so that a person could go in any depth he might desire. It was a free thing, and we pitched in. We had no idea of the enervating effect it would have upon our physical systems. And as the water was but little past tepid, we stayed in a good long time. But when we came out we were as limp as dish rags. About this time, the assembly sounded, and we were ordered to march. But we couldn't march worth a cent. There we had to stay, until our systems had had sufficient recuperation. And we would wonder what all this marching was for, as the war was over anyhow. The second day, after leaving Warm Springs, we came to Big Springs. It was in the month of August, and the biggest white frost fell, that I ever saw in winter. The Yankees were reported to be in close proximity to us, and Captain Field, with a detail of ten men, was sent forward on the scout. I was on the detail, and when we left camp that evening, it was dark and dreary and drizzling rain. After a while the rain began to come down harder and harder, and every one of us was wet and drenched to the skin guns, cartridges, and powder. The next morning about daylight, while standing vidit, I saw a body of twenty-five or thirty Yankees approaching, and I raised my gun for the purpose of shooting, and pulled down, but the cap popped. They discovered me and popped three or four caps at me, their powder was wet also. Before I could get on a fresh cap, Captain Field came running up with his seven shooting rifle, and the first fire he killed a Yankee. A broke and run. Captain Field did all the firing, but every time he pulled down he brought a Yankee. I have forgotten the number that he did kill, but if I am not mistaken it was either twenty or twenty-one. For I remember the incident was in almost every southern paper at that time, and the general comments were that one southern man was equal to twenty Yankees. While we were in hot pursuit, one truly brave and magnanimous Yankee, who had been badly wounded, said, Gentlemen, you have killed me, but not a hundred yards from here is the main line. We did not go any further, but halted right there, and after getting all the information that we could out of the wounded Yankee, we returned to camp. One evening, General Robert E. Lee came to our camp. He was a fine-looking gentleman and wore a mustache. He was dressed in blue cottonade and looked like some good boy's grandpa. I felt like going up to him and saying good evening, Uncle Bob, I am not certain at this late day that I did not do so. I remember going up mighty close and sitting there and listening to his conversation with the officers of our regiment. He had a calm and collected air about him. His voice was kind and tender, and his eye was as gentle as a dove's. His whole make-up of form and person, looks and manner had a kind of gentle and soothing magnetism about it that drew every one to him and made them love. 
respect, and honor him. I fell in love with the old gentleman and felt like going home with him. I know I have never seen a finer-looking man, nor one with more kind and gentle features and manners. His horse was standing nipping the grass, and when I saw that he was getting ready to start, I ran and caught his horse and led him up to him. He took the reins of the bridle in his hand and said, Thank you, my son, rode off, and my heart went with him. There was none of his staff with him. He had on no sword or pistol, or anything to show his rank. The only thing that I remember he had was an opera glass hung over his shoulder by a strap. Leaving Big Springs, we marched on day by day, across Greenbrier and Gauley Rivers to Huntersville, a little but sprightly town hid in the very fastnesses of the mountains. The people live exceedingly well in these mountains. They had plenty of honey and buckwheat cakes, and they called buttermilk sour milk, and sour milk weren't fit for pigs. They couldn't see how folks drank sour milk, but sour kraut was good. Everything seemed to grow in the mountains potatoes, Irish and sweet, onions, snap beans, peas, though the country was very thinly populated, deer, bear, and foxes, as well as wild turkeys, and rabbits and squirrels abounded everywhere. Apples and peaches were abundant, and everywhere the people had apple butter for every meal. And occasionally we would come across a small-sized distillery, which we would at once start to doing duty. We drank the singlings while they were hot, but like the old woman who could not eat corn bread until she heard that they made whiskey out of corn, then she could manage to worry a little of it down, so it was with us and the singlings. From this time forward, we were ever on the march tramp. Lee's Corps, Stonewall Jackson's division, I refer you to the histories for the marches and tramps made by these commanders the first year of the war. Well, we followed them, Cheat Mountain. One evening about four o'clock, the drummers of the regiment began to beat their drums as hard as they could stave. And I saw men running in every direction, and the camp soon became one scene of hurry and excitement. I asked someone what all this hubbub meant. He looked at me with utter astonishment. I saw soldiers running to their tents and grabbing their guns and cartridge boxes and hurry out again. The drums still rolling and rattling. I asked several other fellows what in the Dickens did all this mean. Finally one fellow, who seemed scared almost out of his wits, answered between a wail and a shriek, Why, sir, they are beating the long roll. Says I, what is the long roll for? The long roll, man, the long roll, get your gun. They are beating the long roll. This was all the information that I could get. It was the first, last, and only long roll that I ever heard. But then everything was new, and Colonel Maney, ever prompt, ordered the assembly. Without any command or bugle sound or anything, every soldier was in his place. Tents, knapsacks, and everything was left indiscriminately. We were soon on the march, and we marched on and on and on. About night it began to rain. All our blankets were back in camp, but we were expected every minute to be ordered into action. At night we came to Mingo Flats. The rain still poured. 
We had no rations to eat and nowhere to sleep. Some of us got some fence rails and piled them together and worried through the night as best we could. The next morning we were ordered to march again, but we soon began to get hungry, and we had about half halted, and about not halted at all. Some of the boys were picking blackberries. The main body of the regiment was marching leisurely along the road. When bang, de bang, de bang, bang, and a volley of buck and ball came hurling right through the two advance companies of the regiment companies H and K. We had marched into a Yankee ambuscade. All at once everything was a scene of consternation and confusion. No one seemed equal to the emergency. We did not know whether to run or stand when Captain Field gave the command to fire and charge the bushes. We charged the bushes and saw the Yankees running through them, and we fired on them as they retreated. I do not know how many Yankees were killed, if any. Our Company H had one man killed, Pat Hanley, an Irishman who had joined our company at Chattanooga, Hugh Paget and Dr. Hooper, and perhaps one or two others, were wounded. After the fighting was over, where, oh where, was all the fine rigging heretofore on our officers? They could not be seen. Corporals, sergeants, lieutenants, captains, all had torn all the fine lace off their clothing. I noticed that at the time and was surprised and hurt. I asked several of them why they had torn off the insignia of their rank, and they always answered, Humph. You think that I was going to be a target for the Yankees to shoot at, you see. This was our first battle. And the officers had not found out that many as well as cannonballs were blind that they had no eyes and could not see. They thought that the balls would hunt for them and not hurt the privates. I always shot at privates. It was they that did the shooting and killing, and if I could kill or wound a private. Why, my chances were so much the better. I always looked upon officers as harmless personages. Colonel Field, I suppose, was about the only colonel of the war that did as much shooting as the private soldier. If I shot at an officer, it was at long range, but when we got down to close quarters I always tried to kill those that were trying to kill me. Suell Mountain. From Cheat Mountain we went by forced marches day and night over hill and everlasting mountains, and through lovely and smiling valleys, sometimes the country rich and productive, sometimes rough and broken. Through towns and villages, the names of which I have forgotten, crossing streams and rivers, but continuing our never-ceasing. Unending march, passing through the Kanawha Valley and by the Salt Works, and nearly back to the Ohio River. When we at last reached Suell Mountain, here we found General John B. Floyd strongly entrenched and fortified and facing the advance of the Federal Army. Two days before our arrival he had charged and captured one line of the enemy's works. I know nothing of the battle. See the histories for that. I only write from memory, and that was twenty years ago, but I remember reading in the newspapers at that time of some distinguished man. Whether he was captain, colonel, or general, I have forgotten but I know the papers said he sought the bauble. Reputation at the cannon's mouth, and went to glory from the deathbed of fame. I remember it sounded gloriously in print. Now, 
Reader, this is all I know of this grand battle. I only recollect what the newspapers said about it, and you know that a newspaper always tells the truth. I also know that beef livers sold for one dollar a piece in gold, and here is where we were first paid off in Confederate money. Remaining here a few days, we commenced our march again. Suell Mountain, Harrisonburg, Lewisburg, Cannot Assault Works, first four, forward and back, seemed to be the program of that day. Rosecrans, that wily old fox, kept Lee and Jackson both busy trying to catch him, but Rosie would not be caught. March, 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 tramp, 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 back through the valley to Huntersville and Warm Springs, and up through the most beautiful valley, the Shenandoah in the world. Passing towns and elegant farms and beautiful residences, rich pastures and abundant harvests, which a federal general fighting Joe Hooker. Later in the war, ordered to be so sacked and destroyed that a crow passing over this valley would have to carry his rations. Passing on, we arrived at Winchester. The first night we arrived at this place, the wind blew a perfect hurricane. And every tent and marquee in Lee's and Jackson's army was blown down. This is the first sight we had of Stonewall Jackson riding upon his old sorrel horse, his feet drawn up as if his stirrups were much too short for him, and his old dingy military cap hanging well forward over his head, and his nose erected in the air, his old rusty saber rattling by his side. This is the way the grand old hero of a hundred battles looked. His spirit is yonder with the blessed ones that have gone before, but his history is one that the country will ever be proud of. And his memory will be cherished and loved by the old soldiers who followed him through the war. Romney. Our march to and from Romney was in midwinter in the month of January, 1862. It was the coldest winter known to the oldest inhabitant of these regions. Situated in the most mountainous country in Virginia, and away up near the Maryland and Pennsylvania line. The Storm King seemed to rule in all of his majesty and power. Snow and rain and sleet and tempest seemed to ride and laugh and shriek and howl and moan and groan in all their fury and wrath. The soldiers on this march got very much discouraged and disheartened. As they marched along icicles hung from their clothing, guns and knapsacks, many were badly frostbitten and I heard of many freezing to death along the roadside. My feet peeled off like a peeled onion on that march, and I have not recovered from its effects to this day. The snow and ice on the ground being packed by the soldiers tramping, the horses hitched to the artillery wagons were continually slipping and sliding and falling and wounding themselves and sometimes killing their riders, the wind whistling with a keen and piercing shriek seemed as if they would freeze the marrow in our bones. The soldiers in the whole army got rebellious, almost mutinous, and would curse and abuse Stonewall Jackson. In fact, they called him Fool Tom Jackson. They blamed him for the cold weather. They blamed him for everything. And when he would ride by a regiment, they would take occasion, sotto vos, to abuse him, and call him Fool Tom Jackson. And loud enough for him to hear, soldiers from all commands would fall out of ranks and stop by the roadside, 
and swear that they would not follow such a leader any longer. When Jackson got to Romney and was ready to strike Banks and Meade in a vital point, and which would have changed. Perhaps the destiny of the war and the South, his troops refused to march any further, and he turned, marched back to Winchester and tendered his resignation to the authorities at Richmond. But the great leader's resignation was not accepted. It was in store for him to do some of the hardest fighting and greatest generalship that was done during the war. One night at this place, Romney, I was sent forward with two other soldiers across the wire bridge as picket. One of them was named Schwartz and the other Pfeiffer. He called it Pfeiffer, but spelled it with a P, both full-blooded Dutchmen and belonging to Company E or the German Jagers, Captain Harsh, or, as he was more generally called, God for Dam. When we had crossed the bridge and taken our station for the night, I saw another snowstorm was coming. The zigzag lightnings began to flare and flash, and sheet after sheet of wild flames seemed to burst right over our heads and were hissing around us. The very elements seemed to be one aurora borealis with continued lightning. Streak after streak of lightning seemed to be piercing each the other, the one from the north and the other from the south. The white clouds would roll up, looking like huge snowballs encircled with living fires. The earth and hills and trees were covered with snow, and the lightnings seemed to be playing king, King Canico along its crusted surface. If it thundered at all, it seemed to be between a groaning and a rumbling sound. The trees and hills seemed white with livid fire. I can remember that storm now as the grandest picture that has ever made any impression on my memory. As soon as it quit lightning, the most blinding snowstorm fell that I ever saw. It fell so thick and fast that I got hot. I felt like pulling off my coat. I was freezing. The winds sounded like sweet music. I felt grand, glorious, peculiar. Beautiful things began to play and dance around my head and I supposed I must have dropped to sleep or something. When I felt Schwartz grab me and give me a shake, and at the same time raised his gun and fired, and yelled out at the top of his voice, Here is your mule. The next instant a volley of mini balls was scattering the snow all around us. I tried to walk but my pants and boots were stiff and frozen, and the blood had ceased to circulate in my lower limbs. But Schwartz kept on firing, and at every fire he would yell out, Your is your mool, Pfeiffer could not speak English. And I reckon he said, Here is your mule in Dutch. About the same time we were hailed from three Confederate officers. At full gallop right toward us not to shoot, and as they galloped up to us and thundered right across the bridge, we discovered it was Stonewall Jackson and two of his staff. At the same time, the Yankee cavalry charged us, and we, too, ran back across the bridge. Standing picket on the Potomac, leaving Winchester, we continued up the valley. The night before the attack on Bath or Berkeley Springs, there fell the largest snow I ever saw. Stonewall Jackson had 17,000 soldiers at his command. The Yankees were fortified at Bath. An attack was ordered, 
our regiment marched upon top of a mountain overlooking the movements of both armies in the valley below. About four o'clock one grand charge and rush was made, and the Yankees were routed and scheduled. By some circumstance or other, Lieutenant J. Lee Bullock came in command of the 1st Tennessee Regiment. But Lee was not a graduate of West Point, U.C. The Federals had left some spiked batteries on the hillside. As we were informed by an old citizen and Lee, anxious to capture a battery, gave the new and peculiar command of Soldiers, you are ordered to go forward and capture a battery. Just peer out up that hill. Peer out, march forward, men, peer out carefully. The boys peer out it as best they could. It may have been a new command, and not laid down in Hardee's or Scott's tactics, but Lee was speaking plain English and we understood his meaning perfectly, and even at this late day, I have no doubt that every soldier who heard the command thought it a legal and technical term used by military graduates to go forward and capture a battery. At this place, Bath, a beautiful young lady ran across the street. I have seen many beautiful and pretty women in my life but she was the prettiest one I ever saw. Were you to ask any member of the 1st Tennessee Regiment who was the prettiest woman he ever saw, he would unhesitatingly answer that he saw her at Berkeley Springs during the war. And he would continue the tale and tell you of Lee Bullock's peer out and Stonewall Jackson's charge we rushed down to the big spring bursting out of the mountain side, and it was hot enough to cook an egg. Never did I see soldiers more surprised. The water was so hot we could not drink it. The snow covered the ground and was still falling. That night I stood picket on the Potomac with a detail of the 3rd Arkansas Regiment. I remember how sorry I felt for the poor fellows, because they had enlisted for the war, and we for only twelve months. Before nightfall I took in every object and commenced my weary vigils. I had to stand all night. I could hear the rumblings of the Federal artillery and wagons, and hear the low shuffling sound made by troops on the march. The snow came pelting down as large as goose eggs. About midnight the snow ceased to fall and became quiet. Now and then the snow would fall off the bushes and make a terrible noise. While I was peering through the darkness, my eyes suddenly fell upon the outlines of a man. The more I looked, the more I was convinced that it was a Yankee picket. I could see his hat and coat, yes, see his gun. I was sure that it was a Yankee picket. What was I to do? The relief was several hundred yards in the rear. The more I looked, the more sure I was. At last a cold sweat broke out all over my body. Turkey bumps rose. I summoned all the nerves and bravery that I could command and said, Halt, who goes there? There being no response. I became resolute. I did not wish to fire and arouse the camp, but I marched right up to it and stuck my bayonet through and through it. It was a stump. I tell the above because it illustrates a part of many a private's recollections of the war. In fact, a part of the hardships and suffering that they go through. One secret of Stonewall Jackson's success was that he was such a strict disciplinarian. He did his duty himself and was ever at his post, 
and he expected and demanded of everybody to do the same thing. He would have a man shot at the drop of a hat and drop it himself. The first army order that was ever read to us after being attached to his corps was the shooting to death by musketry of two men who had stopped on the battlefield to carry off a wounded comrade. It was read to us in line of battle at Winchester, Schwartz and Pfeiffer. At Valley Mountain the finest and fattest beef I ever saw was issued to the soldiers, and it was the custom to use tallow for lard. Tallow made good shortening if the biscuits were eaten hot, but if allowed to get cold they had a strong taste of tallow in their flavor that did not taste like the flavor of vanilla or lemon in ice cream and strawberries. And biscuits fried in tallow were something upon the principle of possum and sweet potatoes. Well, Pfeiffer had got the fat from the kidneys of two hindquarters and made a cake of tallow weighing about twenty-five pounds. He wrapped it up and put it carefully away in his knapsack. When the assembly sounded for the march, Pfeiffer strapped on his knapsack. It was pretty heavy, but Pfeiffer was well healed. He knew the good frying. He would get out of that twenty-five pounds of nice fat tallow. And he was willing to tug and toil all day over a muddy and sloppy road for his anticipated hot tallow gravy for supper. We made a long and hard march that day, and about dark went into camp. Fires were made up and water brought, and the soldiers began to get supper. Pfeiffer was in a good humor. He went to get that twenty-five pounds of good, nice fat tallow out of his knapsack. And on opening it, lo and behold, it was a rock that weighed about thirty pounds. Pfeiffer was struck dumb with amazement. He looked bewildered, yea, even silly. I do not think he cursed, because he could not do the subject justice. He looked at that rock with the death stare of a doomed man. But he suspected Schwartz. He went to Schwartz's knapsack, and there he found his cake of tallow. He went to Schwartz and would have killed him had not soldiers interfered and pulled him off by main force. His eyes blazed and looked like those of a tiger when he has just torn his victim limb from limb. I would not have been in Schwartz's shoes for all the tallow in every beef in Virginia. Captain Harsh made Schwartz carry that rock for two days to pacify Pfeiffer. The court-martial. One incident came under my observation while in Virginia that made a deep impression on my mind. One morning, about daybreak, the new guard was relieving the old guard. It was a bitter cold morning, and on coming to our extreme outpost, I saw a soldier he was but a mere boy either dead or asleep at his post. The sergeant commanding the relief went up to him and shook him. He immediately woke up and seemed very much frightened. He was fast asleep at his post. The sergeant had him arrested and carried to the guard house. Two days afterwards, I received notice to appear before a court martial at nine. I was summoned to appear as a witness against him for being asleep at his post in the enemy's country. An example had to be made of someone. He had to be tried for his life. The court-martial was made up of seven or eight officers of a different regiment. The witnesses all testified against him. Charges and specifications were read, and by the rules of war he had to be shot to death by musketry. 
the advocate general for the prosecution made the opening speech. He read the law in a plain, straightforward manner, and said that for a soldier to go to sleep at his post of duty. While so much depended upon him, was the most culpable of all crimes, and the most inexcusable. I trembled in my boots, for on several occasions I knew I had taken a short nap. The advocate general went on further to say, that the picket was the sentinel that held the lives of his countrymen and the liberty of his country in his hands. And it mattered not what may have been his record in the past. At one moment he had forfeited his life to his country. For discipline's sake, if for nothing else, you gentlemen that make up this court-martial find the prisoner guilty. It is necessary for you to be firm, gentlemen, for upon your decision depends the safety of our country. When he had finished, thinks I to myself, gone up the spout, sure, we will have a first-class funeral here before night. Well, as to the lawyer who defended him, I cannot now remember his speeches, but he represented a fair-haired boy leaving his home and family, telling his father and aged mother and darling little sister farewell, and spoke of his proud step, though a mere boy, going to defend his country and his loved ones, but at one weak moment, when nature, tasked and taxed beyond the bounds of human endurance, could stand no longer, and upon the still and silent picket post, when the whole army was hushed in slumber. What wonder is it that he, too, may have fallen asleep while at his post of duty? Some of you gentlemen of this court-martial may have sons, may have brothers, yes, even fathers, in the army. Where are they tonight? You love your children, or your brother or father. This mere youth has a father and mother, and sister away back in Tennessee. They are willing to give him to his country, but, oh, gentlemen, let the word go back to Tennessee that he died upon the battlefield and not by the hands of his own comrades for being asleep at his post of duty. I cannot now remember the speeches, but one thing I do know, that he was acquitted, and I was glad of it. The Death Watch. One more scene I can remember. Kind friends, you that know nothing of a soldier's life, I ask you in all candor not to doubt the following lines in this sketch. You have no doubt read of the old Roman soldier found amid the ruins of Pompeii, who had stood there for sixteen hundred years, and when he was excavated was found at his post with his gun clasped in his skeleton hands. You believe this because it is written in history. I have heard politicians tell it. I have heard it told from the sacred desk. It is true, no one doubts it. Now, were I to tell something that happened in this nineteenth century exactly similar, you would hardly believe it. But whether you believe it or not, it is for you to say. At a little village called Hampshire Crossing, our regiment was ordered to go to a little stream called St. John's Run, to relieve the 14th Georgia Regiment and the 3rd Arkansas. I cannot tell the facts as I desire to. In fact, my hand trembles so, and my feelings are so overcome that it is hard for me to write at all. But we went to the place that we were ordered to go to, and when we arrived there we found the guard sure enough. If I remember correctly, there were just eleven of them. 
Some were sitting down and some were lying down, but each and every one was as cold and as hard frozen as the icicles that hung from their hands and faces and clothing dead. They had died at their post of duty. Two of them, a little in advance of the others, were standing with their guns in their hands, as cold and as hard frozen as a monument of marble standing sentinel with loaded guns in their frozen hands. The tale is told. Were they true men? Does he who noteth the sparrows fall, and numbers the hairs of our heads, have any interest in one like ourselves? Yes. He doth all things well. Not a sparrow falls to the ground without his consent. Virginia, farewell. After having served through all the valley campaign, and marched through all the wonders of northwest Virginia, and being associated with the army of Virginia, it was with sorrow and regret that we bade farewell to old Virginia's shore. To go to other fields of blood and carnage and death. We had learned to love Virginia. We love her now. The people were kind and good to us. They divided their last crust of bread and rasher of bacon with us. We loved Lee. We loved Jackson. We loved the name, association, and people of Virginia. Patton, Forbes, Anderson, Gilliam, Gavan, Loring, Ashby, and Shoemaker were names with which we had been long associated. We hated to leave all our old comrades behind us. We felt that we were proving recreant to the instincts of our own manhood, and that we were leaving those who had stood by us on the march and battlefield when they most needed our help. We knew the 7th and 14th Tennessee regiments. We knew the 3rd Arkansas, the 14th Georgia, and 42nd Virginia regiments. Their names were as familiar as household words. We were about to leave the bones of Joe Bynum and Gus Allen and Patrick Hanley. We were about to bid farewell to every tender association, that we had formed with the good people of Virginia, and to our old associates among the soldiers of the Grand Army of Virginia. Virginia, farewell, away back yonder, in good old Tennessee, our homes and loved ones are being robbed and insulted. Our fields laid waste, our cities sacked, and our people slain. Duty as well as patriotism calls us back to our native home, to try and defend it, as best we can, against an invading army of our then enemies. And, Virginia, once more we bid you a long farewell. Chapter Roman II, Shiloh. This was the first big battle in which our regiment had ever been engaged. I do not pretend to tell of what command distinguished itself, of heroes, of blood and wounds, of shrieks and groans, of brilliant charges, of cannon captured, etc. I was but a private soldier, and if I happened to look to see if I could find out anything, I's right. Guide center was the order, close up, guide right. Halt, forward, right oblique, left oblique, halt, forward. Guide center, eyes right, dress up promptly in the rear, steady, double quick. Charge bayonets, fire at will. Is about all that a private soldier ever knows of a battle. He can see the smoke rise and the flash of the enemy's guns, and he can hear the whistle of the mini and cannon balls. But he has got to load and shoot as hard as he can tear and ram cartridge, or he will soon find out 
like the Irishman who had been shooting blank cartridges. When a ball happened to strike him, and he hallowed out, Faith, Pat, and the jabbers, them fellows are shooting bullets. But I nevertheless remember many things that came under my observation in this battle. I remember a man by the name of Smith stepping deliberately out of the ranks and shooting his finger off to keep out of the fight. Of another poor fellow who was accidentally shot and killed by the discharge of another person's gun, and of others suddenly taken sick with colic. Our regiment was the advance guard on Saturday evening, and did a little skirmishing. But General Gladden's brigade passed us and assumed a position in our immediate front. About daylight on Sunday morning, Chalmers' brigade relieved Gladden's. As Gladden rode by us, a courier rode up and told him something. I do not know what it was, but I heard Gladden say, Tell General Bragg that I have as keen a scent for Yankees as General Chalmers has. On Sunday morning, a clear, beautiful, and still day, the order was given for the whole army to advance and to attack immediately. We were supporting an Alabama brigade. The fire opened bang, 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 a rattle de bang, 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 a boom de bang, 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 boom, bang. Boom, bang, boom, bang, boom, bang, boom. Worse is is a ripping, roaring boom, bang. The air was full of balls and deadly missiles. The litter corps was carrying off the dying and wounded. We could hear the shout of the charge and the incessant roar of the guns, the rattle of the musketry, and knew that the contending forces were engaged in a breast-to-breast -breast struggle. But cheering news continued to come back. Everyone who passed would be hailed with, Well, what news from the front? Well, boys, we are driving him. We have captured all their encampments everything that they had, and all their provisions and army stores. And everything. As we were advancing to the attack and to support the Alabama Brigade in our front, and which had given way and were stricken with fear, some of the boys of our regiment would laugh at them, and ask what they were running for, and would commence to say flicker, 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 like the bird called the yellow hammer. Flicker, 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 as we advanced, on the edge of the battlefield, we saw a big fat colonel of the 23rd Tennessee Regiment badly wounded, whose name, if I remember correctly, was Matt Martin. He said to us, Give em goss, boys. That's right, my brave first Tennessee. Give em hail Columbia. We halted but a moment, and said, I, Colonel, where are you wounded? He answered in a deep bass voice. My son, I am wounded in the arm, in the leg, in the head, in the body, and in another place which I have a delicacy in mentioning. That is what the gallant old Colonel said. Advancing a little further on, we saw General Albert Sidney Johnson surrounded by his staff and Governor Harris of Tennessee. We saw some little commotion among those who surrounded him, but we did not know at the time that he was dead. The fact was kept from the troops. About noon a courier dashed up and ordered us to go forward and support General Bragg's center. We had to pass over the ground where troops had been fighting all day. I had heard and read of battlefields, seen pictures of battlefields, of horses and men, of cannon and wagons, 
all jumbled together while the ground was strewn with dead and dying and wounded. But I must confess that I never realized the pomp and circumstance of the thing called glorious war until I saw this. Men were lying in every conceivable position, the dead lying with their eyes wide open, the wounded begging piteously for help, and some waving their hats and shouting to us to go forward. It all seemed to me a dream. I seemed to be in a sort of haze, when sizz, 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 the many balls from the Yankee line began to whistle around our ears. And I thought of the Irishman when he said, Sure enough, those fellows are shooting bullets. Down would drop first one fellow and then another, either killed or wounded, when we were ordered to charge bayonets. I had been feeling mean all the morning as if I had stolen a sheep, but when the order to charge was given, I got happy. I felt happier than a fellow does when he professes religion at a big Methodist camp meeting. I shouted. It was fun then. Everybody looked happy. We were crowding them. One more charge. Then their lines waver and break. They retreat in wild confusion. We were jubilant. We were triumphant. Officers could not curb the men to keep in line. Discharge after discharge was poured into the retreating line. The Federal dead and wounded covered the ground. When in the very midst of our victory, here comes an order to halt. What? Halt after today's victory? Sidney Johnson killed, General Gladden killed, and a host of generals and other brave men killed. And the whole Yankee army in full retreat. These four letters, H-A-L-T, oh, how harsh they did break upon our ears. The victory was complete, but the word halt turned victory into defeat. The soldiers had passed through the Yankee camps and saw all the good things that they had to eat in their sutlers' stores and officers' marquees. And it was but a short time before every soldier was rummaging to see what he could find. The harvest was great and the laborers were not few. The Negro boys, who were with their young masters as servants, got rich. Greenbacks were plentiful, good clothes were plentiful, rations were not in demand. The boys were in clover. This was Sunday, on Monday the tide was reversed. Now, those Yankees were whipped, fairly whipped, and according to all the rules of war they ought to have retreated. But they didn't. Flushed with their victories at Fort Henry and Fort Donelson and the capture of Nashville. And the whole state of Tennessee having fallen into their hands, victory was again to perch upon their banners. For Buell's army, by forced marches, had come to Grant's assistance at the eleventh hour. Gunboats and transports were busily crossing Buell's army all of Sunday night. We could hear their boats ringing their bells, and hear the puff of smoke and steam from their boilers. Our regiment was the advance outpost, and we saw the skirmish line of the Federals advancing, and then their main line, and then their artillery. We made a good fight on Monday morning, and I was taken by surprise when the order came for us to retreat instead of advance. But as I said before, reader, a private soldier is but an automaton, and knows nothing of what is going on among the generals. And I am only giving the chronicles of little things and events that came under my own observation as I saw them then and remember them now. 
Should you desire to find out more about the battle, I refer you to history. One incident I recollect very well. A Yankee colonel, riding a fine gray mare, was sitting on his horse looking at our advance as if we were on review. W. H. rushed forward and grabbed his horse by the bridle, telling him at the same time to surrender. The Yankee seized the reins, set himself back in the saddle, put the muzzle of his pistol in W. H. S. face and fired. About the time he pulled trigger, a stray ball from some direction struck him in the side, and he fell off dead. And his horse, becoming frightened, galloped off, dragging him through the Confederate lines. His pistol had missed its aim. I have heard hundreds of old soldiers tell of the amount of greenback money they saw and picked up on the battlefield of Shiloh. But they thought it valueless and did not trouble themselves with bringing it off with them. One fellow, a courier, who had had his horse killed, got on a mule he had captured, and in the last charge, before the final and fatal halt was made, just charged right ahead by his lone self, and the soldiers said, Just look at that brave man, charging right in the jaws of death. He began to seesaw the mule and grit his teeth, and finally yelled out, It aren't me, boys, it's this blarsted old mule. Whoa, whoa, on Monday morning I too captured me a mule. He was not a fast mule and I soon found out that he thought he knew as much as I did. He was wise in his own conceit. He had a propensity to take every hog path he came to. All the bombasting that I could give him would not make him accelerate his speed. If blood makes speed, I do not suppose he had a drop of any kind in him, if I wanted him to go on one side of the road, he was sure to be possessed of an equal desire to go on the other side. Finally I and my mule fell out. I got a big hickory and would frail him over the head, and he would only shake his head and flop his ears, and seem to say, Well, now, you think you are smart, don't you? He was a resolute mule, slow to anger, and would have made an excellent merchant to refuse bad pay. Or I will pay your credit, for his whole composition seemed to be made up the one word no. I frequently thought it would be pleasant to split the difference with that mule, and I would gladly have done so if I could have gotten one half of his no. Me and Mule worried along until we came to a creek. Mule did not desire to cross, while I was trying to persuade him with a big stick. A rock in his ear and a twister on his nose. The caisson of a battery was about to cross. The driver said, I will take your mule over for you. So he got a large two-inch rope tied one end around the mule's neck and the other to the caisson, and ordered the driver to whip up. The mule was loath to take to the water. He was no Baptist, and did not believe in immersion, and had his views about crossing streams. But the rope began to tighten, the mule to squeal out his protestations against such villainous proceedings, the rope, however, was stronger than the mule's no, and he was finally prevailed upon by the strength of the rope to cross the creek. On my taking the rope off, he shook himself and seemed to say, You think that you are mighty smart folks. But you are a little too smart. I gave it up that that mule's no was a little stronger than my determination. 
He seemed to be in deep meditation. I got on him again, when all of a sudden he lifted his head, pricked up his ears, began to champ his bit, gave a little squeal, got a little faster, and finally into a gallop and then a run. He seemed all at once to have remembered or to have forgotten something, and was now making up for lost time. With all my pulling and seesawing and strength I could not stop him, until he brought up with me at Corinth, Mississippi, Chapter Roman Three, Corinth, well, here we were again reorganizing, and after our lax discipline on the road to and from Virginia, and after a big battle, which always disorganizes an army, what wonder is it that some men had to be shot? Merely for discipline's sake, and what wonder that General Bragg's name became a terror to deserters and evil doers. Men were shot by scores, and no wonder the army had to be reorganized. Soldiers had enlisted for twelve months only, and had faithfully complied with their volunteer obligations. The terms for which they had enlisted had expired. They had done their duty faithfully and well. They wanted to see their families, in fact, wanted to go home anyhow. War had become a reality. They were tired of it. A law had been passed by the Confederate States Congress called the Conscript Act. A soldier had no right to volunteer and to choose the branch of service he preferred. He was conscripted. From this time until the end of the war, a soldier was simply a machine, a conscript. It was mighty rough on rebels. We cursed the war. We cursed Bragg. We cursed the Southern Confederacy. All our pride and valor had gone, and we were sick of war and the Southern Confederacy. A law was made by the Confederate States Congress about this time allowing every person who owned twenty Negroes to go home. It gave us the blues. We wanted twenty Negroes. Negro property suddenly became very valuable, and there was raised the howl of rich man's war. Poor man's fight. The glory of the war, the glory of the South, the glory and the pride of our volunteers had no charms for the conscript. We were directed to re-elect our officers, and the country was surprised to see the sample of a conscript's choice. The conscript had no choice. He was callous and indifferent whether he had a captain or not. Those who were at first officers had resigned and gone home because they were officers. The poor private, a contemptible conscript, was left to howl and gnash his teeth. The war might as well have ended then and there. The boys were hacked, nay, whipped. They were shorn of the locks of their glory. They had but one ambition now and that was to get out of the army in some way or other. They wanted to join the cavalry or artillery or home guards or pioneer corps or to be yaller dogs or anything. Their last hope had set. They hated war. To their minds the South was a great tyrant and the Confederacy a fraud. They were deserting by thousands. They had no love or respect for General Bragg. When men were to be shot or whipped, the whole army was marched to the horrid scene to see a poor trembling wretch tied to a post and a platoon of twelve men drawn up in line to put him to death. And the hushed command of ready aim, fire, would make the soldier or conscript, I should say, loathed the very name of Southern Confederacy. 
and when some miserable wretch was to be whipped and branded for being absent ten days without leave we had to see him kneel down and have his head shaved smooth and slick as a peeled onion and then stripped to the naked skin then a strapping fellow with a big rawhide would make the blood flow and spurt at every lick the wretch begging and howling like a hound and then he was branded with a red-hot iron with the letter D on both hips. When he was marched through the army to the music of the rogue's march, it was enough. None of General Bragg's soldiers ever loved him. They had no faith in his ability as a general. He was looked upon as a merciless tyrant. The soldiers were very scantily fed. Bragg never was a good feeder or commissary general. Rations with us were always scarce. No extra rations were ever allowed to the Negroes who were with us as servants. No coffee or whiskey or tobacco were ever allowed to be issued to the troops. If they obtained these luxuries, they were not from the government. These luxuries were withheld in order to crush the very heart and spirit of his troops. We were crushed. Bragg was the great autocrat. In the mind of the soldier, his word was law. He loved to crush the spirit of his men. The more of a hangdog look they had about them, the better was General Bragg pleased. Not a single soldier in the whole army ever loved or respected him. But he is dead now, peace to his ashes. We became starved skeletons, naked and ragged rebels. The chronic diarrhea became the scourge of the army. Corinth became one vast hospital. Almost the whole army attended the sick call every morning, all the water courses went dry, and we used water out of filthy pools. Halleck was advancing. We had to fortify Corinth. A vast army, Grant, Buell, Halleck, Sherman, all were advancing on Corinth. Our troops were in no condition to fight. In fact, they had seen enough of this miserable yet tragic farce. They were ready to ring down the curtain, put out the footlights, and go home. They loved the Union anyhow, and were always opposed to this war. But breathe softly the name of Bragg. It had more terror than the advancing hosts of Halleck's army. A shot and shell would come tearing through our ranks. Every now and then a soldier was killed or wounded, and we thought what magnificent folly. Death was welcome. Halleck's whole army of blue coats had no terror now. When we were drawn up in line of battle, a detail of one-tenth of the army was placed in our rear to shoot us down if we ran. No pack of hounds under the master's lash or body of penitentiary convicts were ever under greater surveillance. We were tenfold worse than slaves. Our morale was a thing of the past. The glory of war and the pride of manhood had been sacrificed upon Bragg's tyrannical holocaust. But enough of this. Roland shot to death. One morning I went over to the 23rd Tennessee Regiment, on a visit to Captain Gray Armstrong and Colonel Jim Neal, both of whom were glad to see me, as we were old antebellum friends. While at Colonel Neal's marquee, I saw a detail of soldiers bring out a man by the name of Roland, whom they were going to shoot to death with musketry. By order of a court-martial for desertion, I learned that he had served out the term for which he had originally volunteered. 
had quit our army and joined that of the Yankees, and was captured with Prentice Yankee Brigade at Shiloh. He was being hauled to the place of execution in a wagon, sitting on an old gun box, which was to be his coffin. When they got to the grave, which had been dug the day before, the water had risen in it, and a soldier was bailing it out. Roland spoke up and said, Please hand me a drink of that water, as I want to drink out of my own grave so the boys will talk about it when I am dead. And remember Roland. They handed him the water, and he drank all there was in the bucket, and handing it back asked them to please hand him a little more. As he had heard that water was very scarce in hell, and it would be the last he would ever drink. He was then carried to the death post, and there he began to cut up Jack generally. He began to curse Bragg, Jeff Davis, and the Southern Confederacy, and all the rebels at a terrible rate. He was simply arrogant and very insulting. I felt that he deserved to die. He said he would show the rebels how a Union man could die. I do not know what all he did say. When the shooting detail came up, he went of his own accord and knelt down at the post. The captain commanding the squad gave the command, Ready, aim, fire, and Roland tumbled over on his side. It was the last of Roland, killing a Yankee sharpshooter. In our immediate front at Corinth, Mississippi, our men were being picked off by sharpshooters, and a great many were killed. But no one could tell where the shots came from. At one particular post it was sure death. Every detail that had been sent to this post for a week had been killed. In distributing the detail this post fell to Tom Webb and myself. They were bringing off a dead boy just as we went on duty. Colonel George C. Porter, of the 6th Tennessee, warned us to keep a good lookout. We took our stands. A mini ball whistled right by my head. I don't think it missed me an eighth of an inch. Tom had sat down on an old chunk of wood, and just as he took his seat, Zip, a ball took the chunk of wood. Tom picked it up and began laughing at our tight place. Happening to glance up towards the treetops, I saw a smoke rising above a tree, and about the same time I saw a Yankee peep from behind the tree. Up among the bushes, I quickly called Tom's attention to it and pointed out the place. We could see his ramrod as he handled it while loading his gun, saw him raise his gun, as we thought, to put a cap on it. Tom, in the meantime, had lain flat on his belly and placed his gun across the chunk he had been sitting on. I had taken a rest for my gun by the side of a sapling, and both of us had dead aim at the place where the Yankee was. Finally we saw him sort of peep round the tree, and we moved about a little so that he might see us, and as we did so, the Yankee stepped out in full view, and bang, bang, Tom and I had both shot. We saw that Yankee tumble out like a squirrel. It sounded like distant thunder when that Yankee struck the ground, we heard the Yankees carry him off. One thing I am certain of, and that is, not another Yankee went up that tree that day. And Colonel George C. Porter complimented Tom, and I very highly, on our success. This is where I first saw a Jack Alantern Ignis Fatui.
At night, while Tom and I were on our posts, we saw a number of very dim lights, which seemed to be in motion. At first we took them to be Yankees moving about with lights. Whenever we could get a shot we would blaze away. At last one got up very close, and passed right between Tom and I. I don't think I was ever more scared in my life. My hair stood on end like the quills of the fretful porcupine. I could not imagine what on earth it was. I took it to be some hellish machination of a Yankee trick. I did not know whether to run or stand, until I heard Tom laugh and say, Well, well, that's a Jack O'Lantern. Colonel Field, before proceeding further with these memoirs, I desire to give short sketches of two personages with whom we were identified and closely associated until the winding up of the ball. The first is Colonel Hume R. Field. Colonel Field was born a soldier. I have read many descriptions of Stonewall Jackson. Colonel Field was his exact counterpart. They looked somewhat alike, spoke alike, and alike were trained military soldiers. The War Department at Richmond made a grand mistake in not making him a commander of armies. He was not a brilliant man, could not talk at all. He was a soldier. His conversation was yea and nay, but when you could get yes, sir, and no, sir, out of him his voice was as soft and gentle as a maid's when she says yes to her lover. Fancy, if you please, a man about thirty years old, a dark skin, made swarthy by exposure to sun and rain. Very black eyes that seemed to blaze with a gentle luster. I never saw him the least excited in my life. His face was a face of bronze. His form was somewhat slender, but when you looked at him you saw at the first glance that this would be a dangerous man in a ground scuffle. A foot race or a fight. There was nothing repulsive or forbidding or even domineering in his looks. A child or a dog would make up with him on first sight. He knew not what fear was, or the meaning of the word fear. He had no nerves, or rather, has a rock or tree any nerves. You might as well try to shake the nerves of a rock or tree as those of Colonel Field. He was the bravest man, I think. I ever knew later in the war he was known by every soldier in the army. And the 1st Tennessee Regiment, by his manipulations, became the regiment to occupy tight places. He knew his men. When he struck the Yankee line they felt the blow. He had himself set the example, and so trained his regiment, that all the armies in the world could not whip it. They might kill every man in it, is true, but they would die game to the last man. His men all loved him. He was no disciplinarian, but made his regiment what it was by his own example. And every day on the march you would see some poor old ragged rebel riding his fine gray mare, and he was walking. Captain Joe P. Lee. The other person I wish to speak of is Captain Joe P. Lee, Captain Henry J. Webster, was our regular captain, but was captured while on furlough. And Joe went up by promotion. He was quite a young man, about twenty-one years old but as brave as any old Roman soldier that ever lived. Joe's face was ever wreathed in smiles, and from the beginning to the end he was ever at the head of his company. 
I do not think that any member of the company ever did call him by his title. He was called simply Joe Lee, or more frequently Black Perch. While on duty he was strict and firm, but off duty he was one of us boys. We all loved and respected him, but everybody knows Joe, and further comment is unnecessary. I merely mention these two persons because in this rapid sketch I may have cause occasionally to mention them, and only wish to introduce them to the reader so he may understand more fully my ideas. But, reader, please remember that I am not writing a history at all, and do not propose in these memoirs to be anybody's biographer. I am only giving my own impressions. If other persons think differently from me, it is all right, and I forgive them. Corinth Forsaken. One morning a detail was sent to burn up and destroy all the provisions and army stores and to blow up the arsenal. The town was in a blaze of fire, and the arsenal was roaring and popping and bellowing like pandemonium turned loose as we marched through Corinth on the morning of the evacuation. We bade farewell to Corinth. Its history was black and dark and damning. No little speck of green oasis ever enlivened the dark recesses of our memory while at this place. It's a desert that lives only in bitter memories. It was but one vast graveyard that entombed the life and spirit of once brave and chivalrous men. We left it to the tender mercies of the Yankees, without one tear of sorrow or regret, and bade it farewell forever. Chapter Roman Four Tupelo We went into summer quarters at Tupelo. Our principal occupation at this place was playing poker, chuck-a-luck, and cracking grayback lice. Every soldier had a brigade of lice on him, and I have seen fellows so busily engaged in cracking them that it reminded me of an old woman knitting. At first the boys would go off in the woods and hide to louse themselves, but that was unnecessary, the ground fairly crawled with lice. Pharaoh's people, when they were resisting old Moses, never enjoyed the curse of lice more than we did. The boys would frequently have a louse race. There was one fellow who was winning all the money. His lice would run quicker and crawl faster than anybody's lice. We could not understand it. If some fellow happened to catch a fierce-looking louse, he would call on Dornan for a race. Dornan would come and always win the stake. The lice were placed in plates. This was the race course, and the first that crawled off was the winner. At last we found out D.S. trick. He always heated his plate. Billy P. said he had no lice on him. Did you ever look? No, how do you know then? If ignorance is bliss, tis folly to be wise, said Billy. Why, there is one crawling on your bosom now. Billy took him and put him back in his bosom and said to the louse, You stay there now. This makes the fourth time I have put you back and if I catch you out again today, I will martyr you. Billy was philosophic. The death of one louse did not stop the breed. The court-martial at Tupelo. At this place was held the grand court-martial. Almost every day we would hear a discharge of musketry, and knew that some poor, trembling wretch had bid farewell to mortal things here below. It seemed to be but a question of time with all of us as to when we too would be shot. We were afraid to chirp, 
So far now as patriotism was concerned, we had forgotten all about that, and did not now so much love our country as we feared brag. Men were being led to the death stake every day. I heard of many being shot, but did not see but two men shot myself. I do not know to what regiment they belonged, but I remember that they were mere beardless boys. I did not learn for what crime or the magnitude of their offenses. They might have deserved death for all I know. I saw an old man, about sixty years old, whose name was Dave Brewer, and another man, about forty-five, by the name of Rube Franklin, whipped. There was many a man whipped and branded that I never saw or heard tell of. But the reason I remembered these two was that they belonged to Company of the 23rd Tennessee Regiment, and I knew many men in the regiment. These two men were hung up by the hands after having their heads shaved to a tree put there for the purpose, with the prongs left on them, and one hand was stretched toward one prong and the other hand to another prong. Their feet, perhaps just touching the ground. The man who did the whipping had a thick piece of sole leather, the end of which was cut in three strips, and this tacked on to the end of a paddle. After the charges and specifications had been read, both men being stark naked, the whipper lit in on Rube. Who was the youngest? I do not think he intended to hit as hard as he did, but, being excited himself, he blistered Rube from head to foot thirty-nine lashes was always the number. Now, three times thirty-nine makes one hundred and seventeen. When he struck at all, one lick would make three whelps. When he had finished Rube, the captain commanding the whipping squad told him to lay it on old man Brewer as light as the law would allow. That old man Brewer was so old that he would die that he could not stand it. He struck old man Dave Brewer thirty-nine lashes, but they were laid on light. Old Dave didn't beg and squall like Rube did. He J-E-S-T did whip old man Dave. Like the old preacher who caught the bear on Sunday. They had him up before the church, agreed to let him off if he did not again set his trap. Well, he said, brethren, I J-E-S-T did set it. Raiding on roasting jeers. At this place General Bragg issued an order authorizing citizens to defend themselves against the depredations of soldiers to shoot them down if caught depredating. Well, one day Byron Richardson and myself made a raid on an old citizen's roasting gear patch. We had pulled about all the corn that we could carry. I had my arms full and was about starting for camp when an old citizen raised up and said, Stop there, drop that corn. He had a double-barreled shotgun cocked and leveled at my breast. Come and go with me to General Bragg's headquarters. I intend to take you there by the living God. I was in for it, directed to go in front. I was being marched to Bragg's headquarters. I could see the devil in the old fellow's eye. I tried to beg off with good promises, but the old fellow was deaf to all entreaty. I represented to him all of our hardships and suffering, but the old fellow was inexorable. I was being steadily carried toward Bragg's headquarters. I was determined not to see General Bragg, 
even if the old citizen shot me in the back. And all at once a happy thought struck me, says I, Mr. Byron Richardson is in your field, and if you will go back we can catch him, and you can take both of us to General Bragg. The old fellow's spunk was up. He had captured me so easy. He no doubt thought he could whip a dozen. We went back a short distance, and there was Byron, who had just climbed over the fence and had his arms full. When the old citizen, diverted from me, leveled his double barrel at Byron, when I made a grab for his gun, which was accidentally discharged in the air, and with the assistance of Byron, we had the old fellow and his gun both. The table was turned. We made the old fellow gather as much as he could carry, and made him carry it nearly to camp. When we dismissed him, a wiser if not a better and richer man, we took his gun and bent it around a black jack tree. He was at the soldier's mercy. Chapter V. Kentucky. We go into Kentucky. After being thoroughly reorganized at Tupelo, and the troops had recovered their health and spirits, we made an advance into Kentucky. We took the cars at Tupelo and went to Mobile, from thence across Mobile Bay to Montgomery, Alabama, then to Atlanta. From there to Chattanooga, and then over the mountains afoot to the blue grass regions of Kentucky, the dark and bloody ground. Please remember, patient reader, that I write entirely from memory. I have no data or diary or anything to go by, and memory is a peculiar faculty. I find that I cannot remember towns and battles, and remember only the little things. I remember how gladly the citizens of Kentucky received us. I thought they had the prettiest girls that God ever made. They could not do too much for us. They had heaps and stacks of cooked rations along our route, with wine and cider everywhere. And the glad shouts of hurrah for our southern boys greeted and welcomed us at every house. Ah, oh, the boys felt like soldiers again. The bands played merrier and livelier tunes. It was the patient convalescing. The fever had left him. He was getting fat and strong. The old fire was seen to illuminate his eyes. His step was buoyant and proud. He felt ashamed that he had ever been hacked. He could fight now. It was the same old proud soldier of yore. The bands played Dixie and the Bonnie Blue Flag. The citizens cheered, and the ladies waved their handkerchiefs and threw us bouquets. Ah, those were halcyon days, and your old soldier, kind reader, loves to recall that happy period. Mumfordsville had been captured with 5,000 prisoners. New recruits were continually joining our ranks. Camp Dick Robinson, that immense pile of army stores, had fallen into our hands. We rode upon the summit of the wave of success. The boys had got clean clothes and had their faces washed. I saw then what I had long since forgotten a cockade. The Kentucky girls made cockades for us, and almost every soldier had one pinned on his hat. But stirring events were hastening on, the black cloud of battle, and war had begun then to appear much larger than a man's hand. In fact, we could see the lightning flash and hear the thunder roar. We were at Harrodsburg, 
the Yankees were approaching Perryville under General Buell. The Yankees had been dogging our rear, picking up our stragglers and capturing some of our wagon trains. This good time that we were having was too good to last. We were in an ecstasy akin to heaven. We were happy. The troops were jubilant. Our manhood blood pulsated more warmly. Our patriotism was awakened. Our pride was renewed and stood ready for any emergency. We felt that one southern man could whip twenty Yankees. All was lovely and the goose hung high. We went to dances and parties every night. When General Chalmers marched to Perryville, in flanking and surrounding Mumfordsville, we marched the whole night long. We, the private soldiers, did not know what was going on among the generals. All that we had to do was march, march, march. It mattered not how tired, hungry, or thirsty we were. All that we had to do was to march that whole night long, and every staff officer who would pass, some fellow would say, Hey, mister, how far is it to Mumfordsville? He would answer, Five miles. It seemed to me we traveled a hundred miles and were always within five miles of Mumfordsville. That night we heard a volley of musketry in our immediate front and did not know what it meant, but soon we came to where a few soldiers had lighted some candles and were holding them over the body of a dead soldier. It was Captain Allison, if I remember rightly, of General Cheatham's staff. He was very bloody and had his clothes riddled with balls. I heard that he rode on in front of the advance guard of our army and had no doubt discovered the Yankee picket and came galloping back at full speed in the dark when our advance guard fired on and killed him. We laid down in a graveyard that night and slept, and when we awoke the sun was high in the heavens, shining in our faces. Mumfordsville had surrendered. The next day Dr. C. T. Quintard let me ride his horse nearly all day, while he walked with the web feet. The Battle of Paraville in giving a description of this most memorable battle, I do not pretend to give you figures. And describe how this general looked and how that one spoke, and the other one charged with drawn saber, etc. I know nothing of these things, see the history for that. I was simply a soldier of the line, and I only write of the things I saw. I was in every battle, skirmish, and march that was made by the 1st Tennessee Regiment during the war. And I do not remember of a harder contest and more evenly fought battle than that of Perryville. If it had been two men wrestling, it would have been called a dog fall. Both sides claimed the victory both whipped. I stood picket in Perryville the night before the battle a Yankee on one side of the street. And I on the other. We got very friendly during the night and made a raid upon a citizen's pantry, where we captured a bucket of honey, a pitcher of sweet milk. I believe, in fact, I think all of the citizens of Paraville were taken with a sudden notion of promiscuous visiting about this time. At least, they were not at home to all callers. At length the morning dawned. Our line was drawn up on one side of Paraville, the Yankee army on the other. The two enemies that were soon to meet in deadly embrace seemed to be eyeing each other. 
The blue coats lined the hillside in plain view. You could count the number of their regiments by the number of their flags. We could see the huge war dogs frowning at us, ready at any moment to belch forth their fire and smoke, and hurl their thunderbolts of iron and death in our very midst. I wondered why the fighting did not begin. Never on earth were our troops more eager for the engagement to open. The Yankees commenced to march toward their left, and we marched almost parallel to our right both sides watching each other's maneuvers and movements. It was but the lull that precedes the storm. Colonel Field was commanding our brigade, and Lieutenant Colonel Patterson our regiment. About twelve o'clock, while we were marching through a cornfield, in which the corn had been shocked, they opened their war dogs upon us. The beginning of the end had come. Here is where Captain John F. Ellis was wounded, and three others, whose names I have forgotten. The battle now opened in earnest, and from one end of the line to the other seemed to be a solid sheet of blazing smoke and fire. Our regiment crossed a stream, being preceded by Wharton's Texas Rangers, and we were ordered to attack at once with vigor. Here General Maney's horse was shot. From this moment the battle was a mortal struggle. Two lines of battle confronted us. We killed almost everyone in the first line, and were soon charging over the second. When right in our immediate front was their third and main line of battle from which four Napoleon guns poured their deadly fire. We did not recoil, but our line was fairly hurled back by the leaden hail that was poured into our very faces. Eight color bearers were killed at one discharge of their cannon. We were right up among the very wheels of their Napoleon guns. It was death to retreat now to either side. Our Lieutenant Colonel Patterson hallowed to charge and take their guns. And we were soon in a hand to hand fight every man for himself using the butts of our guns and bayonets. One side would waver and fall back a few yards, and would rally, when the other side would fall back, leaving the four Napoleon guns. And yet the battle raged. Such obstinate fighting I never had seen before or since. The guns were discharged so rapidly that it seemed the earth itself was in a volcanic uproar. The iron storm passed through our ranks, mangling and tearing men to pieces. The very air seemed full of stifling smoke and fire which seemed the very pit of hell, peopled by contending demons. Our men were dead and dying right in the very midst of this grand havoc of battle. It was a life-to-life -life and death-to-death -death grapple. The sun was poised above us, a great red ball sinking slowly in the west. Yet the scene of battle and carnage continued. I cannot describe it. The mantle of night fell upon the scene. I do not know which side whipped, but I know that I helped bring off those four Napoleon guns that night though we were mighty easy about it. They were given to Turner's battery of our brigade, and had the name of our Lieutenant Colonel Patterson and our color bearer. Mitchell, both of whom were killed, inscribed on two of the pieces. I have forgotten the names inscribed on the other two pieces. I saw these very four guns surrendered at Missionary Ridge. But of this another time, the Battle of Paraville presented a strange scene. 
the dead, dying, and wounded of both armies, Confederate and Federal, were blended in inextricable confusion. Now and then a cluster of dead Yankees and close by a cluster of dead rebels. It was like the Englishman's grog Alf and Alf, now, if you wish, kind reader, to find out how many were killed and wounded. I refer you to the histories. I remember one little incident that I laughed at while in the very midst of battle. We were charging through an old citizen's yard when a big yellow cur dog ran out and commenced snapping at the soldier's legs, they kicking at him to keep him off. The next morning he was lying near the same place, but he was a dead dog. I helped bring off our wounded that night. We worked the whole night. The next morning, about daylight, a wounded comrade, Sam Campbell, complained of being cold and asked me to lie down beside him. I did so and was soon asleep. When I awoke, the poor fellow was stiff and cold in death. His spirit had flown to its home beyond the skies. After the battle was over, John T. Tucker, Scott Stevens, A. S. Horsley, and I were detailed to bring off our wounded that night, and we helped to bring off many a poor dying comrade Joe Thompson. Billy Bond, Byron Richardson, the two Allen boys brothers, killed side by side, and Colonel Patterson, who was killed standing right by my side. He was first shot through the hand and was wrapping his handkerchief around it when another ball struck and killed him. I saw W. J. Whitorn, then a stripling boy of fifteen years of age, fall, shot through the neck and collar bone. He fell apparently dead when I saw him all at once jump up, grab his gun and commence loading and firing. And I heard him say, D.N.M., I will fight him as long as I live. We thought he was killed, but he is living yet. We helped bring off a man by the name of Hodge, with his under jaw shot off, and his tongue lolling out. We brought off Captain Lute B. Irvine. Loot was shot through the lungs and was vomiting blood all the while, and begging us to lay him down and let him die. But Loot is living yet. Also, Lieutenant Waldridge, with both eyes shot out. I found him rambling in a briar patch. About fifty members of the Rock City Guards were killed and nearly one hundred wounded. They were led by Captains W. D. Kelly, Wellis, and Steele. Lieutenant Thomas H. Maney was badly wounded. I saw dead on the battlefield a Federal general by the name of Jackson. It was his brigade that fought us so obstinately at this place, and I did hear that they were made up in Kentucky. Colonel Field then commanding our brigade, and on his fine gray mare, rode up almost face to face with General Jackson. Before he was killed, and Colonel Field was shooting all the time with his seven shooting rifle. I cannot tell the one half, or even remember at this late date, the scenes of blood and suffering that I witnessed on the battlefield of Perryville. But its history, like all the balance, has gone into the history of the war, and it has been twenty years ago. And I write entirely from memory. I remember Lieutenant Joe P. Lee and Captain W. C. Flournoy standing right at the muzzle of the Napoleon guns, and the next moment seemed to be enveloped in smoke and fire from the discharge of the cannon. 
When the regiment recoiled under the heavy firing and at the first charge, Billy Webster and I stopped behind a large oak tree and continued to fire at the Yankees until the regiment was again charging upon the four Napoleon guns. Heavily supported by infantry, we were not more than twenty paces from them, and here I was shot through the hat and cartridge box. I remember this because at that time Billy and I were in advance of our line and whenever we saw a Yankee rise to shoot. We shot him, and I desire to mention here that a braver or more noble boy was never created on earth than was Billy Webster. Everybody liked him. He was the flower and chivalry of our regiment. His record as a brave and noble boy will ever live in the hearts of his old comrades, that served with him in Company H. He is up yonder now, and we shall meet again. In these memoirs I only tell what I saw myself, and in this way the world will know the truth. Now, citizen, let me tell you what you never heard before, and this is this there were many men with the rank and pay of general, who were not generals. There were many men with the rank and pay of privates who would have honored and adorned the name of general. Now, I will state further that a private soldier was a private. It mattered not how ignorant a corporal might be, he was always right, it mattered not how intelligent the private might be, and so on up. The sergeant was right over the corporal the sergeant major over the sergeant, the lieutenant over him, and the captain over him, and the major over him, and the colonel over him, and the general over him, and so on up to Jeff Davis. You see, a private had no right to know anything, and that is why generals did all the fighting. And that is today why generals and colonels and captains are great men. They fought the battles of our country. The privates did not. The generals risked their reputation. The private soldier his life. No one ever saw a private in battle. His history would never be written. It was the generals that everybody saw charge such and such, with drawn saber, his eyes flashing fire, his nostrils dilated, and his clarion voice ringing above the din of battle in a horn over the left. Bill Johns and Marsh Pinkard would have made generals that would have distinguished themselves and been an honor to the country. I know today many a private who would have made a good general. I know of many a general who was better fitted to be excused from detail and fights, to hang around a camp and draw rations for the company. A private had no way to distinguish himself. He had to keep in ranks, either in a charge or a retreat. But now, as the generals and colonels fill all the positions of honor and emoluments, the least I say, the better, the retreat out of Kentucky. From Perryville we went to Camp Dick Robinson and drew three days' rations, and then set fire to and destroyed all those great deposits of army stores which would have supplied the South for a year. We ate those rations and commenced our retreat out of Kentucky with empty haversacks and still emptier stomachs. We supposed our general and commissaries knew what they were doing, and at night we would again draw rations. But we didn't. The Yankee cavalry are worrying our rear guards. There is danger of an attack at any moment. No soldier is allowed to break ranks. We thought, well, surely we will draw rations tonight. But we didn't. 
We are marching for Cumberland Gap. The country has long ago been made desolate by the alternate occupation of both armies. There are no provisions in the country. We wanted rations, but we did not get them. Fourth day out Cumberland Gap in the distance a great indenture in the ranges of Cumberland Mountains. The scene was grand, but grand scenery had but little attraction for a hungry soldier. Surely we will get rations at Cumberland Gap. Toil on up the hill, and when halfway up the hill, halt, march back down to the foot of the hill to defend the cavalry. I was hungry. A cavalryman was passing our regiment with a pile of scorched dough on the pummel of his saddle. Says I, halt, I am going to have a paddock of that bread. Don't give it to him, don't give it to him, was yelled out from all sides. I cocked my gun and was about to raise it to my shoulder when he handed me over a paddock of scorched dough. And every fellow in Company H made a grab for it, and I only got about two or three mouthfuls. About dark a wild heifer ran by our regiment, and I pulled down on her. We killed and skinned her, and I cut off about five pounds of hindquarter. In three minutes there was no sign of that beef left to tell the tale. We ate that beef raw and without salt. Only eight miles now to Cumberland Gap, and we will get rations now. But we didn't. We descended the mountain on the southern side. No rations yet. Well, says I, this won't do me. I am going to hunt something to eat. Brag or no brag. I turned off the road and struck out through the country, but had gone but a short distance before I came across a group of soldiers clambering over something. It was Tom Tuck with a barrel of sorghum that he had captured from a good Union man. He was selling it out at five dollars a quart. I paid my five dollars, and by pushing and scrooging I finally got my quart. I sat down and drank it. It was bully. It was not so good. It was not worth a cent. I was sick, and have never loved sorghum since. Along the route it was nothing but tramp, tramp, tramp and no sound or noise but the same inevitable, monotonous tramp. Weary, worn out, and hungry, no cheerful warble of a merry songster would ever greet our ears. It was always tramp, 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 you might, every now and then, hear the occasional words close up. But outside of that, it was but the same tramp, tramp, tramp. I have seen soldiers fast asleep, and no doubt dreaming of home and loved ones there, as they staggered along in their places in the ranks. I know that on many a weary night's march I have slept, and slept soundly while marching along in my proper place in the ranks of the company. Stepping to the same step as the soldier in front of me did. Sometimes, when weary, broken down and worn out, some member of the regiment would start a tune, and every man would join in. John Branch was usually the leader of the choir. He would commence a beautiful tune. The words, as I remember them now, were Dear Paul, just twenty years ago. After singing this piece, he would commence on a lively, spirit-stirring air to the tune of Old Uncle Ned. Now, reader, it has been twenty years ago since I heard it, but I can remember a part of it now. 
Here it is. There was an ancient individual whose cognomen was Uncle Edward. He departed this life long since, long since. He had no capillary substance on the top of his cranium. The place where the capillary substance ought to vegetate. His digits were as long as the bamboo piscatorial implement of the southern Mississippi. He had no oculars to observe the beauties of nature. He had no ossified formation to masticate his daily rations, so he had to let his daily rations pass by with impunity. Walker Coleman raises the tune of Isaac Wine to join the rebel band, a fightin' for my home. Now, reader, the above is all I can now remember of that very beautiful and soul-stirring air. But the boys would wake up and step quicker and livelier for some time, and Arthur Fulgham would holloa out. All right, go ahead, and Ben would toot, toot, as if the cars were starting puff, 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 and then he would say, Tickets, gentlemen, tickets, gentlemen, like he was conductor on a train of cars. This little episode would be over, and then would commence the same tramp. Step by step, step by step, we continued to plod and nod and stagger and march, tramp, tramp, tramp. After a while we would see the morning star rise in the east, and then after a while the dim gray twilight. And finally we could discover the outlines of our file leader, and after a while could make out the outlines of trees and other objects. And as it would get lighter and lighter, and day would be about to break, cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo would come from Tom Tuck's rooster. And then the sun would begin to shoot his slender rays athwart the eastern sky, and the boys would wake up and begin laughing and talking as if they had just risen from a good feather bed, and were perfectly refreshed and happy. We would usually stop at some branch or other about breakfast time, and all wash our hands and faces and eat breakfast, if we had any and then commence our weary march again. If we were halted for one minute, every soldier would drop down and resting on his knapsack. Sometimes the thanks for watching this video book is provided by Stream Books.